All right, everyone, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our Water Watch Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Brian, and I work for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. If, uh, if you are unfamiliar with the NSRWA, we are a small uh, grassroots nonprofit uh, with a mission to preserve and protect our most valuable natural resource um, through education, engagement, uh, advocacy, scientific monitoring, and, and research. Uh, we strive to preserve and protect uh, and ensure um, uh, fresh and clean drinkable water for people, for habitat, uh, for the environment, uh, for now and for the future. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. And um, uh, I'd like to give a big shout out to our sponsors. That would be Clean Harbors, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Duxbury and Plymouth. Um, thank you so much for your continued support year after year for educational programs like these. Uh, so um, I'm joined by uh, tonight. Well, tonight's uh, lecture really excited about. I'm joined by um, Manamit shorebird biologist Liana Denunzio, as well as uh, Mass Audubon educator Douglas Lowry. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to them uh, to go ahead and uh, kick off tonight's presentation. Thanks to both of you for joining us tonight. Hello. <laughs> I can hear you. All right. I'm going to share. Can you see my screen all right? Yep, we can. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, both Brian and Doug, for inviting me to be part of this. I've been watching these Water Watch lectures for a long time, and this is my first time participating. So um, thanks for having me. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm a shorebird biologist for Manimit. My work focuses on shorebirds that are migrating through Massachusetts. And a lot of the shorebird species I work with um, are long distance migrants that breed far up in the Arctic and spend their winters um, way down south, and they stop over in Massachusetts to rest and refuel along the way. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar with Manimit, we're a nonprofit conservation and research organization. We started back in 1969 um, as a bird observatory and bird banding laboratory in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And while we're still, we still have a headquarters in Plymouth and we still run a bird banding station, we have since expanded um, both our work and our reach. So since the 1970s, we've been working on shorebird research and conservation. We also work on coastal resiliency projects and education as well is, is even more than that. And then we also have expanded our staff. So now we have staff members throughout the Western hemisphere to carry out this work. So um, we're just in the watershed next door. So feel free to come visit us anytime. Um, and I'll pass it over to Doug to introduce himself. <laughs> Good evening, folks. So glad you decided to join us today, uh, tonight. And very excited, as we always are, to be part of this Water Watch series. Um, Mass Audubon's been involved uh, since the start, uh, and the watershed has just been an amazing uh, host for all these years, uh, and really appreciate Brian's work to make this, uh, Brian and his co-workers, uh, to make this possible each, each week in the winter. So really excited to be here. And very, very excited also to be uh, co-presenting with Liana. Uh, Menemet is just a, an amazing organization um, and it's uh, exciting to see uh, that it, it really has made some big moves lately uh, and it will become more and more of a, a mover and shaker. So that's, that's really exciting. And they are experts uh, in, in this realm here. So we're really happy to have Liana as part of this. So why don't we start, Leon? Oh, yeah, thanks. Way, so. <laughs> you know, we're gonna we're gonna be using. We just joked with with Brian. It's gonna be a fire hose tonight, folks. We got an awful lot of information coming your way, and we're gonna do our best to get get it in at, at a at a pace that's understandable, uh, but but conclusive. So uh, bear with us as we as we dive down into this subject pretty deeply. 
All right, here we go. Would you like me to go to the sure. next slide? Yeah. So we're not going to spend a lot of time defining climate change because we know that the folks that are with us tonight pretty much uh, are, are, are self-selective. Uh, it's, it's rare to find people that still are doubters. Uh, so we're not going to try to make a case for climate change, uh, but do want to bring up a few points that I think they're, are worth, uh, well, putting in the spotlight. One is climate change is, is rapid, uh, much more rapid than we would like uh, and much more rapid than we have admitted. Uh, and there's no question that humans have been part of uh, the change in climate. And it's the human activities like uh, green, releasing greenhouse gases and all of our re um, reliance on fossil fuels uh, but we also know that things can change uh, if we get bold and start thinking on large scales uh, with actions, policies, and both from governments uh, and also nonprofits and other organizations. And then the other thing that's really come into play lately is an understanding that any solution to mitigating climate change has to address social and ec economic disparities. We can't move forward with, uh, with fixing uh, our problems without fixing things on a much more social level. So off we go to the next. Weather and climate, you probably know the difference. Uh, and you know, there's some, there was a Senator one time that stood up with a snowball in his hand and said, see, uh, I have a snowball, so can't be, there can't be climate change. Well, that nonsense is out the window. We know the difference between weather and climate, uh, and uh, we, we accept it, and this is how we move forward. Closer to home in Massachusetts, with the next slide, you'll see that things have been recorded uh, over a period of time. And wow, it can be a little sobering. So you can see quickly, we've risen almost three degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the last 10, uh, well, in the last, since 1960, yes. We have 11 more days of growing season. Our storms are stronger by 55% more rain and less snow in winter and more frequent droughts. Now that was absolutely in play yesterday. And then this one is most sobering because we live on the watersheds on our coast and we see it. Uh, the people, working people that work on the coast, the fisher folk, the lobster folk, uh, anybody that has anything to do with making a living near the coast knows this. Uh, so that's sobering. 1922 in Boston Harbor, it, the sea level has risen 11 inches. Uh, and we can see that, uh, you know, right here in Marsh, Marshfield Situate, the coast of Marshfield Situate, uh, the last few uh, tide cycles have been way over what they've been predicted. And some of that, of course, is wind generated, but uh, we're finding that our tides are much, much higher overall. And then the next, and just, you know, a reminder of why it's so important to, uh, to, to pay attention to our watershed, the land and uh, marshes of the watershed. They are so important for so many different reasons that you are well aware of because of the work of uh, organizations like the watershed. Now we are going to define a little bit about birds because birds are going to be our vehicle. So real quick, these are bird categories by locale. Now these are not uh, essentially, oops, let's, let's take it back. There we go. Um, so there's a few words here. So a breeder, uh, if you will, is a bird that will migrate here and breed. It comes to this area to breed or it could be a resident that breeds here. 
A resident is a resident year round that breeds. An invasive species is something like the mute swan that has, uh, did not uh, evolve here, but came in for, for other, from other areas for different reasons. Uh, a winter visitor, like our snowbird or the, the junco here on the top right-hand photo, is a bird that, for the most part, lives <clears throat> and breeds north of us, but comes down here during the winter, uh, kind of like their version of warmer weather. An adapter is a bird that is in our community that over the years has found ways uh, to exist in the changing climate, like the bluebird and the robin. We just have a lot more of them. They've always been around uh, historically, but uh, they're getting more and more comfortable in larger numbers. And then the range expander is something like the Carolina wren that has actually uh, drastically moved into the area in numbers um, that are pretty impressive. So things like cardinals and, and uh, red-bellied woodpeckers are examples of other range expanders. And so as long as it, start, it stays warmer each winter, they are finding ways to adapt to the climate. And then finally, our next slide is gonna be what we're gonna to highlight today, birds that migrate. Now this particular uh, bird is kind of a dynamo. So you can see, um, and Liana, you can go ahead and, and, and there we go. So this bird has a, a number of ways it, it breeds uh, in the Arctic, in the boreal forests of the Arctic. And its range, breeding range is, is pretty widespread. Some of them will actually breed in the uh, maritime provinces. But the takeaway here is that this bird who weighs only half an ounce on its return trip, uh, if it chooses to take the Atlantic coast uh, uh, route, will leave the maritime provinces and fly nonstop for three days over 1,678 miles to get to uh, its wintering habitat. The little map on the right is from our breeding uh, map, uh, 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 state of the birds. And there has been documented cases of a black pole warbler uh, breeding in uh, Northwest Massachusetts in, in the Berkshires, high elevations. But just think of the amount of energy on fuel and calories it takes for a half an ounce bird to travel three days over that, such a long distance. And that's why they are particularly vulnerable to changes in uh, our phenology and our climate. And that's gonna be a theme throughout tonight. Take it away, Leon. All right, so uh, migratory birds face a lot of challenges in order to um, go through this long journey. So migration is just inherently dangerous. It's physically strenuous, as Doug mentioned. These birds are sometimes traveling nonstop for a couple thousand miles just on their own fat reserves. Um, they're also facing storms if a bird is flying nonstop over a large body of water like an ocean they could um, risk getting getting blown off course or even injured um, if they run into a storm and of course with climate change storms are increasing both in frequency and intensity um, there's also a new threat um, that that pose that um, challenges migrating birds, and that is um, offshore wind developments. So these, of course, are being built to combat climate change. We need these renewable energy sources, but if they were are um, installed within a migration route, migratory birds um, risk colliding with them as they're flying through and being injured or possibly killed. So there's a lot of um, different threats that challenge birds during the actual traveling portion of their migrations. Um, but they also face challenges when they're just stopping to rest and refuel. Um, you know, they can fly a couple thousand miles nonstop, but along the way, they will usually have to stop to rest and eat for a little while. And a lot of these birds have um, 
consistent sites that they like to visit every year. And if they stop at one of those sites, they might experience um, habitat loss there, maybe from human development or sea level rise. So the habitat might be not be of good quality anymore. Um, and this might impact their food resources. It's crucial that they get enough to eat at these stopovers. So um, if the food resource they're looking for isn't there, they risk not not being able to refuel enough to continue and survive their journey. So um, there are some birds that are kind of facing the question of, do I stay or do I go? Um, you know, is it really worth the benefit of migrating or should we just stay, stay where we are? And um, some birds have actually been observed doing that um, with milder winters. Um, birds have been, you know, overwintering farther farther north than they have historically, um, as in the case of these red knots in the photo, which are currently overwintering right at Duxbury Beach. Um, the winter is mild enough and they have a food supply, so um, they just happen to be spending the winter. And um, we've been seeing a lot more of these cases lately. Um, just get the, oh, back to Doug. <laughs> Sorry, I got to stay unmuted. So Monday, this was uh, report was released, and it's from the uh, Convention of Migratory Species. And again, it's it's pretty sobering. And so birds aren't the only thing that migrate. Um, and you'll see that, especially this ninety percent uh, is incredible. Ninety percent of av the average decline of of a uh, convention of migratory species fish uh, have lost, we've lost them since 1970. Uh, and, and so what, uh, we can go to the next slide for sure. So what does that mean? So Inger Anderson, who's the UN Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the UN Environmental Program, says this, when we talk about the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste, we often focus on hard hit ecosystems and the communities and species that live and suffer in them year round. We rarely talk about the migratory species that undertake astonishing journeys between these ecosystems, often through air, land and water, increasingly damaged by unsustainable activities. So this is kind of just uh, bolstering what, what Liana just described. So why do, why are birds such reliable truth tellers? Uh, well, many reasons, but essentially in a nutshell, because the research has been done on birds and been gathered for decades. Uh, one of the incredible things is, they, their biology is, is one of the reasons why they, they're so uh, helpful because they typically feed towards the top of food webs uh, and they're an eye-catching gauge. People love to bird uh, and they're, they also will kind of determine or spot or show uh, changes further down in the food chain, uh, such as declines in the abundance of things they eat. Um, fewer bug eating birds like flycatchers may be the telltale sign of, of diminish, diminishing insect populations. Uh, the other thing um, they do is they tend to move in response to environmental changes with their local abundance, reflecting changes in the climate of how land is used. And bird populations tends, uh, trends often mirror those of other species. And the, the, the idea of, of understanding these changes, there's over 16,000 scientific papers on bird biology and that are published each year. So plenty of information. And how they gain that is, we're gonna explore that right now. So bird banning is huge. Uh, it's been done for many, many years. And what they do essentially is they put up mist nets, 
in uh, early in the morning and early in the evening. And uh, the birds that are flying around will, will fly into these net, uh, mist nets and uh, ornithologists and their helpers will go around and check these nets regularly, very frequently. They gather the birds in a little cloth bag and they bring it to a bander who's an ornithologist. And that bander will record an awful lot of information. It will record their weight, their, uh, they'll look at their body fat, uh, they'll look at their muscle degradation, they'll measure uh, and note their molting uh, patterns and where they are in, in that regard. And then they'll ban them um, if they already aren't banded in hopes that someday these birds will be caught again and uh, where they are caught will tell us a lot about the distance uh, and uh, they've traveled and where they've traveled from. So this has been going on for a, a long, long time and there's been an awful lot of information already uh, determined by it. Another way uh, is through citizen science and the annual Christmas count uh, is one of the oldest. Uh, it started in 1900, and you can see there with 27 participants. And then last year, in its 124th year, there were almost 80,000 participants. And that's over, uh, all, pretty much over the, the new world, if you will. So all of North and South and Central America, there's, there's counts going on. And yes, it's uh, a bit amateurish because anybody can participate, but there's also strength in numbers uh, and integrity in the length of the, uh, the okay, that count. And also uh, it, it is peer reviewed to some degree. And, and so anything that's really out of, out of uh, character or out of whack is, is usually dismissed. Uh, but this, this has been going on for a long time and it's really helped us understand uh, bird populations. And, and, and it's later, uh, right, uh, next slide, please. You have probably heard about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It is an amazing uh, source for birds and bird research. And eBird is a way that kind of uh, ramps up citizen science by having it uh, reviewed by experts. So. It's a way to anybody can go out and take uh, surveys of what birds they see and record it and send it to a data bank where it's reviewed uh, and anything, any red flags that pop up are, are uh, followed up on. So it's a much more accurate uh, understanding of, of bird populations where. It's also massively popular and so the number of birds that are that are counted each year has uh, is just incredible and that information has been very very helpful uh, moving forward um, yes and it's uh, it's a free download so if, if you ever in, interested in birding or taking your birding to the next level then go to Cornell and download Merlin and get involved with eBird Liana. Sorry, I advanced a little soon. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> All right. So another way that volunteers can contribute to bird research is through the International Shorebird Survey, or ISS. So the ISS was started back in 1974 by Manomet biologist Brian Harrington. And around the same time, two sister surveys were also started in Canada. And the goal of these surveys was to learn more about shorebird, shorebird migration throughout the Western Hemisphere. Um, and ever since then, hundreds of volunteers have counted shorebirds and sites all throughout the Americas. Um, so this was really a mostly volunteer-led effort. However, there are some partner organizations, government agencies and other conservation organizations that also contribute to the shorebird count. Um, and these shorebirds are typically counted during spring and fall migration. Um, and the data from the ISS can be used to help um, figure out shorebird population estimates and also trends over time. And I'll give you a little example of that. 
So um, last year in 2023, a paper was published on an analysis of ISS data. So this volunteer collected data was actually analyzed by a bunch of scientists and published in a paper. So this analysis looked at both ISS data and those Canada shorebird survey data. It looked at the southbound migration, which occurs in the fall here, at least this in the Northern hemisphere. It looked at shorebird counts from 1980 to 2019, and they looked at 28 different shorebird species and the counts for them over that time. So you can see in this graph on the vertical axis, that's the total percent change in population between 1980 to 2019. And then on the horizontal axis is all 28 shorebird species that they looked at. And um, this zero right in the center of the graph, um, that means that there was no change. So all of the points that are below that, the bird species was declined during that period of time and anything above that, um, they increased a little bit over that period of time. So the results were um, a little bit um, concerning as I ended up that 26 out of the 28 shorebird species declined between 1980 to 2019. And some, some of them declined as much as 98% during that period of time in the case of the red knot, which is all the way to the left. Um, so while this um, is not good news for the shorebirds, um, studies like these are really important for highlighting the need for conservation and which species we need to focus on. Um, and in this case, it's all thanks to um, all those volunteers collecting all the, that data. So now we'll move on to kind of what some, some scientists are doing to better study birds. Um, so technological advances over the past few decades have helped scientists answer questions about birds and their migrations that they haven't been able to before. Um, and one of these technologies is telemetry. So this allows scientists to know where, where birds are and learn more about their movements and migrations without actually having to find the birds and follow them in person. As you can imagine, that would be very difficult since they can fly and we cannot. So telemetry allows scientists to collect this location data remotely. Um, so there's kind of a basic method for tracking birds this way. First, the scientists need to catch the bird. Then they attach a small sensor or tag to the bird. Then they release it back into the wild. And then for the most part, the scientists can just kind of sit back and wait for the data to be collected. Um, so there's two different types of telemetry that are commonly used to track birds. Um, one is radio telemetry and the other is satellite telemetry. Um, and the difference is in the way the sensor that's attached to the bird is detected. So for radio telemetry, the radio tags emit unique radio signals that are then detected by radio antenna. Now the bird needs to fly within a certain range of that antenna to be picked up, usually within nine miles of, of the antenna. And then um, that, that antenna, wherever it is, it detects any tagged bird that flies by and downloads that data to a computer for use by a scientist. Um, and then satellite telemetry, um, the tags are detected by, you guessed it, satellite networks. And this allows birds to be, birds to be detected in more locations than radio telemetry, because they don't have to fly within a certain um, radius of a fixed location on Earth. They just have to, you know, have satellite signal, basically. Sometimes it requires certain cell towers, but um, definitely way more lo location data. So here's some examples of what these tags look like. Um, some of them can be small enough to fit on a bird's leg or on the back of a tiny songbird. Um, and typically the more advanced the tag and technology are, the heavier or larger the tag would be, um, such as the satellite tags. And these can typically only be used on larger birds. Um, 
And scientists do need permits to conduct this work. So it's not something you can go out and do in your own backyard. And there are plenty of standards and guidelines to help minimize any negative impacts to the tagged birds. Um, for example, the tags need to be very lightweight, typically less than three to 5% of the bird's total body weight. And they need to be attached to the bird in a way that doesn't restrict any of their activities like flying or eating or nesting. So here's a photo of one of the radio antennas attached to a tower. Um, this is some Manomet staff installing um, a radio tower um, in Chile. And the map on the left shows all nine, uh, there's over 900 of these towers set up throughout the Americas. Um, and this is called the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. So as I mentioned, the birds need to actually fly within about nine miles of these radio towers to be detected. So the data is a little bit coarse, but it can usually give scientists a general idea of the birds' migration routes. And sometimes that's all they need. But if they do need more detailed data, they could potentially use a satellite tag. So I'm going to give an example of um, a st Manomet study that used satellite telemetry to track Wimbrel from Cape Cod throughout their migration. So Wimbrel are a type of shorebird. They're about the size of a chicken. And this is a photo of them right here. They have long down curved bills that help them to extract difficult to reach food, such as fiddler, fiddler crabs out of their burrows. Um, and they are a declining shorebird species. Um, so, so scientists like, like scientists from Manimit and some other partner organizations are trying to gather more information about them, more information about their populations, the trends in their populations, um, and their, their ecology. Um, this will help us better understand the cause for the decline in population for Wimbrel and, and hopefully um, help us figure out some ways to help them. So for our particular study, we caught and deployed satellite transmitters on Wimbrel and Cape Cod while they were stopped over there during their migration. Um, and then we you know, have collected a lot of da data ever since um, the first bird was caught back in 2015. So satellite telemetry data can tell us a lot, of, um, a lot about migration. Um, the first thing they could tell us is the timing of migration. So it can tell us when a bird arrives to a particular site, um, such as their breeding grounds. It can tell us how long they stayed there and then how long it took them to travel to the next site. Um, so while this isn't the main um, focus of our study with the Wimbrel, um, if this data is collected over a long period of time, it could potentially detect shifts in short in, in bird migration phenology. Um, and this would be interesting because this is a potential um, ca potentially caused by climate change. So by looking at their timing over years, we can see if there's any shifts. It can also show us their mi migration routes. So this is actually some of the data from our Cape Cod study. So we caught all the birds and deployed the transmitters in Cape Cod. And you can see all of the birds flying over the Atlantic nonstop to their non-breeding grounds, either in the Caribbean or South America. So it's important to know what the birds are flying over. Um, this is particularly important for knowing where to install offshore wind developments. Um, as I mentioned before, offshore wind developments are kind of a new threat to migratory shorebirds. If they were developed right in a really popular migratory route, um, it could cause a lot of mortality for certain species. So scientists are actually contributing their bird tracking data to offshore wind developers to help them minimize impacts to shorebirds and other migratory birds um, by avoiding building in, in popular migration routes. So um, this, this little insert on the left shows how detailed this data can actually be. This shows um, one of the Wimbrel feeding in a marsh in Cape Cod. So you can actually see where it was walking around eating. So it's, it's pretty neat. Another thing satellite telemetry data can tell us is 
what sites birds are using throughout their life cycle. So this map was created from tracking data for two adult wimbrel. Um, one was caught by Manamit in Cape Cod, and the other one was caught by our partners from the College of William and Mary. And we were able to find out where they spend their non-breeding season, which is our winter, um, in Brazil. We were able to find out where their nesting grounds are in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And we're also able to find all their stopover locations in between where they stop to rest during migration. So it's important to find out um, all the sites that especially species in decline is using because it can help scientists better monitor their populations and find trends in their populations over time. Um, it's also a good way to find out if there's any threats to the birds at these locations. So then we can figure out what conservation measures need to be implemented there to help alleviate these threats. Um, and there's a photo of a nest in the Arctic. And this is actually one of the birds that we were tracking. You can see the tiny little tag attached to its back. So scientists are getting a lot of really great um, information through satellite telemetry. Um, so now I'm going to kick it back over to Doug. We're going to switch from how we collect the data to what the data is telling us. <laughs> right, and we're going to have to speed up because I think we're on slide 23. <laughs> so we're going to crank it. So here we go. Phenology is the study of cyclical and seasonal natural phenomenon. Uh, and especially in relation to climate and plant and, plant and animal life. So uh, you'll see, we're going to use March as an example. You'll see, we'll illustrate this. So go ahead you know, and just kick it forward. So pussy willows come out in early March. And what pussy willows means that there's food for insects now. So now the, bee, now the uh, insects come out, uh, especially the bees and other pollinators. And then as soon insects are out and the things like uh, our flycatchers, Eastern Phoebe being one of the first ones to arrive back in our neck of the woods, uh, will come up as long as there's food now available. And so they are trying to get a jump, what migration is, is trying to get a jump ahead of their competition for food sources and breeding space, best, you know, best nest uh, grounds. Uh, so that's what's happening. Uh, you can see that if there's any sort of variation in that timing, uh, things can be difficult or they could collapse. Another example is shadbush that we're so familiar with. When it comes out, then it's an indication that the herring are running. Uh, the watershed knows a little bit about herring, I think. And then uh, in comes, uh, when the herring are starting to run, we're going to see a, a larger proportion of herring gulls come in. So. You should hit it again. There we go. So any again, any any sort of uh, variation in any of those events can uh, have consequences uh, and, and can be exponential as well. Uh, you can see that the the system can fall apart. So uh, in in along those lines, the next slide. Go ahead and let it let it rip. Uh, one of example here is the Magnolia warbler, and it is essentially linked. Its its migration timing is linked when uh, there's others, but especially red oak catkins start to uh, emerge. And as soon as they start to emerge, then the food, the insect, the oak worm, uh, is what the Magnolia warbler is looking for. Uh, for its migration, it needs fuel, and when it gets to breeding ground, it also needs uh, food for its young. So everything has to line up. We'll go to the next. And you might remember this from your uh, schools as you grew older. I'm sure many of us uh, were in some sort of environmental ed program, and the whole web of life concept once you take one element out of that web, then the web collapses. So it's a, a, a lesson we need to keep reminding ourselves of. Here's a, a again, we get back to the sobering map here. Uh, look at the difference in uh, 
in just this a short amount of time. So this is basically a, a map that shows how much different uh, the average leaf leafing of trees is from uh, when it was 2012 to 2017. Pretty drastic. Uh, so next. And we always right. to talk oh. about one, <laughs> one uh, particular bird uh, that is definitely being, uh, habits being changed because of uh, phenology, change in phenology. Yeah, thanks. So um, the, the star of this example will be the red knot. They are a federally threatened shorebird species. They're about the size of a robin and have red breasts as well, but they're a type of sandpiper. Um, they can be found in typically coastal habitats, such as beaches, mudflats, and marshes during migration and non-breeding season. And then they shift to the Arctic tundra to nest and raise their chicks. Oh, sorry, let me... There we go. Um, so these birds have amazing migrations. As I mentioned, they breed in the Arctic and they can spend their non-breeding season as far south as the Tierra del Fuego in Chile. So that's about 9,000 miles one way. Um, and they make this trip twice a year, um, going north in the spring and south in the fall. So some of these birds are traveling about 18,000 miles a year. And as we mentioned before, some of these birds can fly nonstop a couple thousand miles, but it's absolutely crucial that they stop and rest and refuel along the way. Um, we call these areas stopovers. Um, and Massachusetts is actually a stopover for red knots. Um, so they make these long, difficult migrations um, to take advantage of the abundance of food in certain areas. And Arctic nesting shorebirds like red knots are definitely do this. So they arrive in the Arctic um, just in time for an explosion of food resources, which for them is insects and invertebrates. And then they can also take advantage of there being less threats from predators and parasites in the Arctic than in lower latitudes, um, especially the tropics. So um, scientists have been detecting a mismatch in phenology between Arctic nesting shorebirds like the red knot and their food sources. So the average annual temperature in the Arctic has risen about two to three degrees Celsius since the 1950s. And this warming of the Arctic has caused um, an earlier emergence of insects. So the emergence of insects is typically um, based on local weather conditions in the Arctic, such as temperature and snow melt. So the earlier the snow melts in the season, the sooner the insects emerge, and then the sooner they peak in abundance. And on the other hand, the shorebirds, like the red knot, um, their cues to start their northbound migration towards their breeding grounds is based on cues at their faraway non-breeding sites. Um, so they're usually triggered by changes in day length and local wind conditions. So, you know, they can't just pull out their smartphone and look at their weather app and see what the weather is like in the Arctic and then, you know, plan their breeding season around that. They can only um, be, know when to start migrating based on the local conditions. And if they are not able to adapt their migrations, to keep up with this earlier emergence and peak abundance of food in the Arctic, um, they could risk raising their chicks during a time with not enough food resources. And this would, of course, um, reduce chick survival and then over time cause declines in shorebird populations. Um, so there are um, indications that some birds are starting to migrate a little bit earlier, um, but not all of them. Um, however, this is still a developing story and um, researchers are definitely keeping a close eye on it. So back over to Doug. <laughs> so Mass Audubon has been for a few decades now putting together a report called State of the Birds every five years or so um, uh, interrupted by the pandemic unfortunately this last go around. But in, in this research uh, and in these surveys of breeding birds in Massachusetts, you can see uh, that there's been significant changes. So 43% uh, of breeding species are classified as highly vulnerable 
and you can kind of read down the list um, for sure. Uh, and if you wanted to examine this slide a little better, then certainly you know you could watch the the uh, the copy of this uh, when it's posted. But one of the things that we want to point out is the black capped chickadee, our state bird, is highly vulnerable, and it's estimated that if uh, if things go the way they have been uh, and continue to go the way they are, then uh, we won't see the black capped chickadee breed in Massachusetts uh, as early as 2050. Uh, so again, uh, important to, to keep paying attention to these, to these populations. How about next slide? So uh, again, I think Liana talked about this at the very beginning, birds are changing their habits and uh, being able to stay around uh, in winters. And this one's a famous, uh, well, it's probably one of many now, uh, great blue herons that live around the coastal areas of Massachusetts. We have, we have dozens of them that decide to stay through the winter here in the watershed. Uh, this one in, in particular is at uh, Daniel Webster Wildlife Sanctuary, and it basically has changed its diet in the winter almost exclusively to the eastern meadow bowl. Um, you know, a, quite a testament to this bird's ability to adapt, uh, but it has significance. It, it, the fact that there's a now competition from great blue herons in uh, these grasslands, uh, it means that there's a uh, little less food going around for our traditional overwintering predators, uh, like our raptors, our short-eared owls, and our uh, northern harriers. So again, everything has an effect, a cause and effect uh, as we move forward. And now we're gonna do a rapid fire here. So let's think about uh, the different kinds of habitat loss. Uh, and then eventually we're gonna finish up with uh, how things are being mitigated. So. Big picture, habitat loss, coastal, you know, it's, it's so important to us because of where we live. Uh, we have uh, salt marsh. Uh, so next slide. Uh, salt marsh loss in migration. So one of the things that we, um, that happens naturally with salt marshes is that they will advance uphill uh, as the sea level rises uh, and sea level rise is a natural occurrence. But uh, it needs room, it needs um, landscape, it needs territory to move up into uh, uh, the, our areas to expand. And unfortunately, we have so many things going on that prevent that. But here's a very quick profile of what a salt marsh looks like. And each one of these uh, sections is important and the integrity of each one of these sections needs to be intact for the wildlife that has evolved in this habitat and ecosystem and to exist. And again, any, any loss of significant loss of any one of these species is compounded uh, quickly. So our next, this is an example. Uh, yeah, and you can just let it fly, yeah. This is an example right out my backyard. So this is uh, in Green Harbor, and this is a salt marsh that we live adjacent to. And in our time here, 35 years, we uh, we noticed, you know, obviously there's hardscapes, and so there's a, there's a limit, uh, a big limit as to where this salt marsh can grow as the sea level rise rises. So it needs room for that Spartina and alternate flora. Uh, the salt marsh glass, grass, and then it, the patens, which is the, the next uh, grass that comes up, it's, it's salt, salt marsh hay, it's often called. Then high tide bush comes up after that, uh, and then into the red cedars. And what we're finding is that along the coast, these red cedars or forests are dying. They're getting drowned by sea level rise. And what's taking place, uh, place of them is this high tide bush. Uh, so naturally, uh, we're good uh, in this neighborhood because we have this room for the salt marsh to expand in this direction, but certainly not against the backs of those houses, which are often uh, 
protected by seawalls and, and revetments. So let's go to the next one. Great, so I can um, give a quick example of a species of bird that is feeling these impacts to the salt marsh that are um, partly caused by climate change. So this is the salt marsh sparrow. They are a salt marsh obligate, which means they only live in salt marshes. And they actually nest in salt marshes too. So they will actually build their nest down in the marsh grass, which you can see is not very tall. They build little cup, cup nests with the grasses and it's actually kind of inserted right there into the grass. Um, and since they live in a tidally influenced environment, their whole nesting cycle revolves around the tide cycle and the lunar cycle. Um, so they prefer to nest in the higher marsh, which only gets flooded about, you know, once a month with the highest high tide of the month. And they need to be able to build their nest, lay their eggs, hatch their eggs, and then raise their babies until they're big enough to hop out of the nest and you know, navigate the marsh on their own. So they have, you know, a pretty, pretty quick timeline to get this all done. Um, if they kind of get off schedule, they risk their nests flooding. Um, and if the nest just floods a little bit, that's all right. The, you know, eggs will just float and then land right back into the nest. But if the water goes too high, it could potentially wash the eggs out of the nest or wash the chicks out of the nest or um, drown the chicks. So it's kind of um, kind of a sketchy place to raise their their chicks to begin with. Um, but this flooding is increasing um, with sea level rise, of course. So these um, flooding incidents happen more often and are um, impacting the survival of salt marsh sparrow chicks. Um, they're also impacted by habitat loss. The higher marsh that they prefer to nest in is um, being flooded more and turning into a lower marsh. Um, so it's not as suitable for their nesting and they're losing losing habitat that way. And as Doug mentioned, you know, they're they're losing habitat on the landward side too from human development um, and the inability of the marsh to migrate that way. So they're getting squeezed kind of from both sides and their, their populations have declined about 75% since the 90s. 1990s, and scientists predict if things continue this way, they could be extinct by um, 2050, which is um, very sobering that this little bird in our lives right in our backyards could be extinct within our lifetimes. Um, but there are plenty of organizations out there trying to help protect the remaining populations, and they're actually one of the birds that helped um, inspire the creation of the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. It was the loss of their song from the marshes around there that called the founders to action. So we're rooting for this, this guy. <laughs> so moving inland, uh, we see uh, certainly forests are getting uh, impact directly. And so the bigger, more intense storms and heavier precipitation uh, basically damage a long, a long landing long living stands uh, of, of uh, forest and that uh, relates to and causes flooding and erosion. Um, so the flip side to that is with these bigger storms we're having, there's also longer and more intense uh, periods of drought. So it has kind of a double whammy. The other thing is, again, uh, there's a cause and effect. So the next we have direct damage and then there's indirect damage. So once a species is under stress, it is susceptible to uh, a lot of other things happening. And so things like mites and uh, blight uh, and insect infestation can come in rapidly and, and finish the job. One uh, thing, that the next slide will show you an incredible change in recent history. So, the forests of New England, or basically Pennsylvania, New York, and New England, or predominantly maple, beech, and birch uh, for 30 years between 1960 and 1990, 
and things have slowly changed. A lot of those maple birch and beeches are dying out and they're being replaced. Well, they're, they're, they're moving further north, getting squeezed. Uh, and, and in place, we're getting more oak and hickory forests, uh, which can mean an entirely different habitat for these birds that are coming through and, and relying on a particular kind of habitat and insect uh, and breeding ground. So. Uh, very difficult. Next slide. We're going to explore an uh, oven bird as an example of that. It's a long distance uh, migrator for sure. Uh, you can see it, it too has a long uh, path from Mexico, Central America, uh, and they'll, they'll read from North Carolina to Canada, uh, but they're highly vulnerable they are ground nesters in mixed forests. And so when those forests become more and more, uh, more of a monoculture, uh, then their, their area is getting degraded as well. Uh, so yes, there's forest composition, the habitat and phenology, kind of the cyclical uh, life of, of those forests uh, have both changed the oven birds uh, numbers significantly. Then we'll go to the grassland. And this is a uh, particular of importance with a lot of our watershed, uh, even though we're a coastal community for being as close to the coast, we are lucky to have uh, pr pretty large tracts of grassland around that it's protected. Uh, and so one of the most important ones is Daniel Webster Wildlife Sanctuary. In Marshfield, it is an important bird area designated as such, and it's home to a number of grassland breeding species, including the meadowlark, but uh, best known for bobolink uh, populations. And there are hundreds of pairs, and here's this at handsome bobolink there. And you can, again, at a huge distance, uh, it has to migrate. Um, and so, yes. There's things in place like the uh, bobbling project where uh, Mass Audubon kind of is the conduit. We're not the only one involved with this, but it's uh, we find ways to pay farmers to delay their haying until after bobbling uh, are successfully bred. Let's go to the next one. And just as a, a theme here, because we are focusing on the coast, um, these are some of the other generalizations, not only with, with uh, salt marsh, but in, in our mud flats, uh, but also our uh, coastal, uh, coastal nesting species like piping plovers and least terns. And again, we're up against those seawalls and jetties that make a huge difference. So let's go to the next and let's start talking about, yay, things are doing, there are things that happen and they're that are really uh, encouraging. And there's a lot of organizations that are part of it. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of what Mass Audubon's doing, uh, but we are not alone. Uh, you, you know the strengths of the watershed and what they've been doing. Uh, Manomet is, is doing an amazing job of, of getting the word out. But here we go. The, one of the most famous uh, restoration projects on the East Coast is Tidmarsh Wildlife Sanctuary. It was for, 100 years uh, working cranberry bog. And what we're looking down on was a cranberry bog 10 years ago. So pretty outstanding. So we'll go to the next slide. And this gives you an overview of the original, or uh, it, the left-hand uh, image gives you an idea of what the bogs looked like when they were in production. And but unfortunately, cranberry Farming is falling by the wayside uh, because of the scale necessary to be successful at it uh, is increasing and we just don't have the capacity and smaller farms are going under. And so this particular one, you can see in just 10 short years, the idea was to completely return this parcel of land back to as close to its original state as possible and they use things like ground penetrating radar to determine where the original stream bed was. They, they tore out all of the flumes and dams and dikes that, uh, that were there to restore the original flow of the stream. And things are amazing, amazing how quick they come back. They've uncovered some of the areas where the, the cranberries were actually grown. 
uh, scoured down below uh, where the was influenced by the, the growing of cranberries and that includes layers of uh, sand added over the years. And they got down to the original uh, profile, so, soil profile and seeds that were covered for over a hundred years propagated. It's incredible what, uh, what nature can, is capable of. And if we can come up with these large scale projects that imitate nature has done so well over the years, then we are making huge progress. Another example would be the next uh, down at Allen's Pond. Uh, and, and this is, you know, again, kind of echoes with the work that the watershed is doing with the salt marshes around North and South rivers is uh, trying to restore them. Uh, as sea level rise comes up, their salt marshes are particularly vulnerable to uh, conditions that will drown them essentially. And so a lot of the things that we've done with salt marshes before need to be mitigated. The, the ditches that were dug to, for mosquito control, uh, a lot of experimentation with filling them back in, uh, finding ways to run these puddles of harshly drowned uh, salt marshes uh, with these uh, runnels, uh, making sure that the water can run back out uh, during the tide to restore uh, the, the integrity of the marsh. Uh, next slide. I see that we are coming close to our time here, but Miana, I think we're close. Uh, very uh, close to our watershed is these huge projects that are undergoing uh, on Green Harbor Beach and Duxbury Beach. And it's a, you can see by the sign there, it's a consort, it's a large group of organizations that are all working on this, including uh, municipalities and uh, some nonprofits and the, the uh, government as well. Uh, and to restore or to add what they, what they call it is a nourishment. So what happens with seawalls, with, with uh, abetments and uh, breakwaters is it interrupts the natural flow of sand along our beaches. You know, our barrier beaches are supposed to be fluid and be able to, uh, to build and, and rebuild and, and uh, have sand um, continue to replenish uh, the beach further down uh, the current. And it, anyway, uh, that's not happening. Um, and so we have to add sand once in a while. And this is something that's happening right now. And I think they're going to be finished up in March. And if you uh, take a walk, take a walk on Green Harbor Beach or Duxbury Beach, uh, and you will uh, see some amazing work being done there. And this is going to help our, uh, our migrating shorebirds. It's going to give them not up against the seawall, perhaps, but uh, further down uh, on Duxbury Beach, it's going to give them more beach to use as uh, both nesting area and also feeding area. Oh, I'll just quickly go over some of the things that Manamit's been doing to help with these um, shorebird declines. Um, as I mentioned, we're conducting targeted research to better understand the reasons for these declines. Um, this is so we can work with a network of partners throughout the Western Hemisphere to figure out um, what's causing these declines and to implement conservation measures on the ground, such as habitat restoration, like Doug was talking about, or even sometimes having to create new habitat for shorebirds. And what can you do? Well, you probably already do a lot. But the fact that you're here is an indication of that. And if you're a, a member of the watershed uh, or Mass Audubon or both or uh, donate to Manomet or have participated in Manomet activities or programs, then you've already done an amazing, you're, you're, you're helping in huge ways. Uh, but there are some things you can do beyond that for sure. Uh, there is, uh, when we get a lot of voices together, uh, people listen. And so uh, if you're so inclined or have the capacity, get on some of those boards. Um, 
in local town. You can make changes. Uh, who's that Margaret Mead's quote of something like, you know, if you want to get something done, then uh, it's a small group of, of people working together that is, is, the, uh, is the change agent. And it's basically the only thing that's ever, ever worked is small conscientious people working, working together. Uh, make choices about uh, what you're consuming uh, with birds in particular, especially our songbirds is uh, buy bird friendly uh, coffee. Um, yeah, and, and see if you can be, be the person in your neighborhood that, that goes around and talks about the importance in, uh, of turning lights off during migration. You don't need your, your yard, you know, looking like a landing strip. Shut them all off and, and uh, it, that'll help uh, our birds to migrate uninterrupted. Uh, and then, you know, get behind things that you really support. Uh, so work with conviction and then talk about climate change solutions. Don't be afraid to, to, to cover the subject in, in conversations with friends, et cetera. Uh, and then you can take it uh, to other levels. Um, and, and these are kind of fun. So join us for a program, or a volunteer opportunity or work with a census. So the, Picture the photo on the left. You might see that handsome individual, Brian, right there on the left-hand side. Uh, he is, uh, we are partnering with the watershed on Thursdays, in fact, tomorrow morning, uh, with a program called Birding uh, in a Changing Climate. And we, we uh, visit areas around the watershed and talk about changes that we're seeing uh, in bird species that are, are uh, affected by those changes. And that happens um, every third Thursday of the month. And we meet at the North River office of Mass Audubon. We hop in the vans on occasion and drive to particular spots uh, and, and explore for, for a few hours. And then it looks like Liana up there in the upper right-hand corner, that's something up your alley. Yeah, so um, if you're interested in helping out shorebirds or and interested in watching shorebirds, um, you can contact Manimit to see how you can become a part of the International Shorebird Survey, where you would volunteer during the spring and fall migrations. And we'll also be having our second annual Massachusetts Shorebird Blitz coming up in August. We did the first one last year. It was um, about 10 days of intensive shorebird surveys throughout the entire Massachusetts coast. We counted over 73,000 birds of 29 different species. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So um, look out, we don't have the date set yet, but coming soon. <laughs> and then Brian, if you're there, uh, lower right-hand uh, photograph, uh, I think that's up your alley. Yeah, yeah, Doug. Um, so I am not the one to talk specifically uh, in the best detail about some of our um, water quality monitoring, but we uh, have been uh, doing a lot of programs throughout the South Shore, especially, well, most notably, obviously, on the North and South Rivers, um, uh, checking for water quality primarily, especially in the summertime. We survey 10 sites on the North and South River um, that are looking into both um, comparing the water, uh, sampling the water and comparing it to Massachusetts state swimming and shellfish um, standards. Uh, and so, and we post that every month, actually every couple of weeks during the summertime. Uh, so that way, if you're going swimming or you're doing some shellfishing, which actually I think as of right now, all shellfish beds are closed um, on the North and South. But uh, for swimming standards, uh, that data is always posted, and we send that out in our e-news, our bi-weekly e-news as well. Um, and then we are doing some water sampling through uh, in the town of Hanover um, on some of the smaller tributaries looking for um, point to non-point source pollution. So all this stuff is going on, and you, anyone can become a volunteer, just like uh, anyone can donate or become a member with any with uh, uh, the Watershed Mass Audubon or support Manimit. And so um, going on to our website and checking out how you can get involved is always really important so so thanks thanks doug yeah and it's just a, these are just a drop in the bucket of what, what all the organizations are doing mass audubon has this new program called climate and nature champions uh they they get together monthly and they they uh, think about ways they can support legislation 
and make a, a, an impact with numbers. So if you are interested in, in uh, learning more about that, uh, go to our website and, and, uh, and use Climate and Nature Champions as your search. And you'll soon be a, a, on a page that'll give you that information. And then uh, finally, real quick, uh, I'm just gonna highlight again tomorrow's program. Uh, we're really excited to be partnering with the North and South Rivers Water so Association uh, with this birding and the ch changing climate. The rest of this you can find on Mass Audubon's website. Uh, the best way to get there is to get very specific about your search and go to uh, North River Adult Programs and it'll get you uh, a list. Uh, and with that, Diana and I thank you so much for spending time with us. <laughs> And uh, yeah, thank so you. <laughs> we 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 didn't get it into an hour, but we tried. <laughs> well <Love> done, Doug. <laughs> I, a fantastic presentation to the both of you. Really, yeah, is incredibly informative. Um, there are some questions here. I know that there are um, a lot of these questions did get answered through the presentation, but I will go through a couple here. By the way, uh, a big shout out to all of you participating. We have had at least 100 people at on all the presentations uh, so far. So, and that's never happened before. So thank all of you for, for tuning in uh, week after week. Um, so there are a couple questions about people curious as to in the tagging pro and I'm going to lump some of these questions together. Um, so people curious as to in the tagging process or the netting process, a little concerned about does that hurt the bird or can that cause any mortality uh, or changing in its uh, migratory uh, uh, trajectories and things like that. So, you know, any effects on what we're doing to the bird, can that hurt or have, what have you guys been seeing? Yeah, so scientists, oh. No, go, go, you go. Oh yes, <laughs> there's a lot of guidelines to keep this process as safe and stress-free as possible. For the birds it does of course temporarily impact their day and it can stress them out a little bit but um, scientists are always very aware of that and try to make the process as quick um, for them as possible and, and try to make it as safe as as possible for them as well um, so they're and they also usually only use these kind of processes to get really specific data that you can't get elsewhere so they always look for alternative ways to collect data as well that are less impactful yeah, and one of the things that helps that is that they're they're constantly monitored. Those mist nests, uh, people are going around. You know, no, like well, the ones they do do uh, on the Cape at Wellfleet. There, there's you know, people going. They're never left that net for more than fifteen minutes. Uh, and so, uh, and then the other thing is, some of the birds get their uh, get their revenge. Um, in the, uh, a lot of the banders say. Uh, things like nuthatches and cardinals uh, often give them a good nip as they're releasing them. But it's amazing how delicate uh, it, they handle the birds. Uh, yeah, but but yes, there there's a there's an impact. It can be traumatic. I imagine once in a while ones will get uh, tangled to the point where that could be an injury to the the wing. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, what do birds do when we have development or buildings that have been built in, in typical habitat or stopping uh, resting areas or uh, for a lot of our migratory species? Well, there's certainly a, a greater risk for, for collision. Um, you know, there's a lot of sky, it's, cities are known for their skyscrapers, but also known for uh, their deaths, you know, in, in large numbers of birds, migratory, migratory birds that, that hit uh, buildings during their migration. Uh, and then, of course, if, if they are coming back and, and are expecting to, to land at a, at a favorite or a traditional uh, refueling stop and, and it's gone, then they're at the mercy of finding other uh, potential replacements. Uh, and that can be difficult because the, the 
with another species or there could be increased competition, et cetera. Okay. Um, so has your research, so when it comes to a lot of this research, I know some of it has only been going on for a few years and, and we're, a lot of the data has, is being built, um, but what are some success stories or has any of this data uh, uh, transformed into some success or increased populations? Maybe that might be a little bit more pointed towards Liana. Um, yeah, there's um, been some great um, progress made in increasing American oyster catcher numbers. They're another type of, of shorebird and they were in decline and um, Minimit helped lead this with a lot of other partners who, who work with oyster catchers, but they formed an oyster catcher working group and they did um, large oyster catcher um, you know, coastwide surveys to get get good estimates of their numbers, and they would repeat those every few years to kind of see what the trends were over time. Um, at the same time, they were meeting and working through um, ways to alleviate threats to them as well, um, such as um, protecting their habitat, creating new habitat for them, um, finding ways to decrease disturbance to their nesting areas. So um, that was a really great. Um, Oh, in the most recent survey, they've they've noticed um, that the numbers have have gone up. That was it was just this year that they kind of released um, that the numbers are actually increasing as a re result of all this hard work from all the different partners throughout the coast. So, um, yeah, great, great way that the research is influencing the action on the ground. <laughs> yeah, and kind of not not exactly the same. Uh, question, but the other thing that uh, radio tracking has done is readjusted uh, bird esti population estimates. Uh, so ground truthing a lot of, of what we had previously thought. Uh, the snowy owl is a great example. Because of the snowy owl, uh, its, its habit of breeding and where it breeds, we made an assumption uh, that the world population of snowy owls was 300,000 at one point. But once we started tracking, well, when I say we, once, <laughs> once people like Norm Smith and, and crew uh, started um, tracking uh, snowy owls, they realized how much more nomadic they were. Uh, and they had to greatly reduce the uh, population estimate back down to 30,000. So, you know, what it does is give us, you know, more scientific, uh, you, you lead, you, everything you do, you let the science lead you to it. Any, any, uh, any conclusions you make uh, or any changes you make or any research or, or solutions you make, you've got to have it back with, with science. And so this tracking has really, again, uh, brought accuracy to some of our populations to begin with. Thanks to the both of you. Um, so when it comes to a lot of the changing phenology occurring with the migratory birds, um, as well as with most, I'm sure most birds, how well are these birds adapting to these changes? Are they looking for new areas to live, shortening their range of migration? You want to take that, or I, I can take a stab. <laughs> okay, okay. It's <laughs> probably a little both. We can both <laughs> speak to this. So yeah, there's. I mean, there's ex examples of those adapters, if you will. Uh, things like uh, the Carolina wren and the uh, red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, that th their numbers, uh, you know, were unheard of in our territory in our communities 30 years ago. Uh, cardinals. Uh, are, was a, originally a southern species, uh, but now you know now you see them in, in Vermont in northern New England in the in the winter. Uh, so the, yeah, they they've adapted. Now sometimes it is to the demise of other species. Uh, you know, again, it's that cause and effect kind of thing. So although we might lose our uh, black cap chickadee. Carolina chickadee might move further north, and that's what's happening with, with that species. So there, there's some adjustment, but it's not without consequence. 
Yeah, and there might be other some some things that offset the negative impacts that climate change brings. For example, um, those little shorebird chicks trying to survive the Arctic winter, and if they don't have enough food because of the insects emerging sooner, um, that could possibly just be offset by the fact that it's warmer in the Arctic, so they're not expending as much energy to stay warm. So maybe they don't even really need all those extra calories. So scientists are kind of thinking through how how these um, climate change stories are going to play out over time and um, watching closely how the birds adapt to it. <laughs> all great points. Um, so there's a comment followed by a question. Great work being done by all groups here. Uh, since they say children are our future, uh, what do you do to engage primary and secondary students to not, <laughs> to not uh, listen to what's being said by others, deniers, you know, uh, things of that nature. So what, what, and I can certainly speak to this too, because I know that both organizations, all three organizations here have uh, good education programs going on. But maybe if you guys want to start off, maybe Doug, if you want to go ahead first. Well, one th I'll, I'll just say that, you know, uh, it, when I, when I get discouraged, I, I look to youth. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, that they, they don't have the luxury of, that we do, of like, oh, you know, we're going to work on this, but, you know, you know, I'm not going to be here in another 20 years, probably, you know, uh, so I don't have as much invested. I'm, I'm certainly going to do what I can, but uh, they don't have that privilege. You know, they, their world is going to not exist unless, unless things change fast, and so I look to a lot of what they say, what youth say about climate change, uh, so, you know, you get the credits, you, you, you get uh, this, what do they call it? Um, there's this uh, stubborn optimism that's coming out of the youth uh, climate uh, champions uh, that, that I find really refreshing. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they don't, they're not deterred by or, or, or tricked by uh, some of the way we try to uh, whitewash climate change. They know it's happening. They know they have to ha do something about it. And they're willing to change uh, their lifestyle in order for it to happen. Yeah. Liana, is there anything that you want to add in, in terms of what Manimit's doing in their education department? Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're definitely, you know, teaching people about all the work we do and the challenges that are facing birds and, and fish, um, especially in our areas. Um, they, our education program has a great um, relationship with, the, um, with Brockton schools, and they are all about talking about climate change impacts happening in their own communities and things that they can do to help curb that. And a big, there's a big emphasis on con, kind of coming together as a community and working together to, to solve these problems that they're seeing just all around them. So not thinking about the Arctic, thinking about what they can do right there in their own community. So <laughs> that's a great point. And I know from the North South Rivers standpoint, uh, we we do bring um, both uh, indoor and outdoor education to local schools, uh, just getting students, youth um, excited and engaged at the outdoors. Um, from our standpoint, the more we can get uh, outside to engage in nature, the more likely they are to want to preserve and protect going forward. And so as an example, we do have our Water Smarter fifth grade program that we bring to all South Shore area elementary schools and some middle schools, um, educating um, thousands of students about how to preserve and protect water uh, conserve water, uh, limit stormwater pollution, and, and just all these little things to help them um, uh, just get excited and want to preserve and protect uh, their water in their communities. So um, that's a good, um, a great thing that's, that's going on with all, all these organizations. Um, so and Brian, to think, to think of how many of those fifth graders have then educated their parents. That's, that's a great what, point. About what's happening. That is a great point. That's a great point. And that's not even to mention all the great um, outdoor engagement opportunities that I know that all three of our organizations do to get people outside and into nature so they can see it for themselves and want to make those connections, uh, which is really important. Um, so I, 
I know I want to be really respectful of all of our time here. I see there's lots of folks who are still hanging on. I, I really appreciate that. There are some questions that we did not get to, but everyone who is in here has my email and can send me any questions and I can send those to uh, whoever needs. I can send them to either of these two. Uh, so, and that goes for any of the past lectures as well. We really, really appreciate all of you uh, being here uh, and supporting educational programs like this. I do see a comment in here saying that these Zoom uh, programs are very convenient, but uh, they do miss uh, being in company of live events, which Doug and I were just talking about for next year. Um, uh, well, not just next year, but the last one at Stellwagen. Uh, so the, the trivia night is still has some spots available. So please, that is a separate registration. It is free, but wherever you sign up for this lecture, you will see the link for that program as well. Um, and so, uh, but Doug, is there anything, I know that you and I were talking about for next year, we might want to start to bring back more, if not all the lectures in person, but maybe that's sort of a TBD. What do you think, Doug? Oh, I say if we say it, we we'll have to we'll have to uh, be yeah. Let's say it. Let's say it. Let's we're gonna do it. <laughs> oh, I would love that. I would love that. Well, <laughs> stay tuned, everyone, because uh, hopefully I. I I miss that as well. And uh, and so, and I know that a lot of folks here would, would certainly like to re-engage, but of course we will always have the option of of uh, engaging folks at home as well, because this is definitely a great way of, of getting people who might not be a local uh, or have the capacity to come meet us at a location. So, um, so in-person and virtual, this definitely seems like um, going forward. And I can see some comments coming in. They like the Zoom as well. So yeah, well, hybrid, I think maybe the way to go. We won't, we won't get rid of Zoom. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a combo. Yeah, do a combo. Yep, yep. Um, well, thanks, Doug. Liana, this is in, uh, incredibly informative. And uh, I know our viewers, as well as myself, have learned so much tonight. So um, thanks to the both of you for um, for uh, participating. Liana, is there anything, any closing remarks you want to say on behalf of Manamit? Um, yeah, just, well, thanks so much for having us. And we're just next door in Plymouth, our headquarters. So feel free to come by and visit us and check out our website for more information. <laughs> Thanks, Liana. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and Doug, as always, thank you so much, especially for um, providing your expertise tonight. Oh, my, my pleasure. Yeah. And uh, check out Manamet. Get on their website, check them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another yeah. huge resource for the area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks to the both of you for, for being here tonight. And also, um, of course, we would like to thank our sponsors, Clean Harbors, uh, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Plymouth, and Duxbury. Thanks so much for your continued support. Um, uh, so with that, uh, Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Thanks all of you for being here tonight and have a great night. We'll see you next week. <laughs>